listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome in once again to the Hazard Ground Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we get to this week's guest, our typical homework slash house cleaning, uh, go to our website, hazardground.com, and click on that Amazon banner right in the middle of the homepage. You got any Amazon shopping to do? This is the way you go about doing it. Why? Because you can help veterans without ever leaving your house. Again, the website, hazardground.com, click on the Amazon banner, do all your normal Amazon shopping. We'll get a percentage of what you spend. We take that percentage, donate it right back to some of the great charities you've heard here on the Hazard Ground. So you're actually helping out vets just by going to our website first and then clicking on the Amazon banner to do your Amazon shopping. Continue to follow us and all the social media sites and get some friends to follow us as well too. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at Hazard Ground, at Hazard Ground Podcast. You can't miss us. Google also is the easiest way to find us via social media. Finally, send us an email, producer at hazardground.com. We want to hear from you as far as what what products you would like to see us have sponsored here on the Hazard Ground. Trying to help you guys out more, trying to be a little bit more uh, fan-friendly, interactive, whatever products you guys want to see featured here as sponsors of each episode, let us know. We'll work on getting them on. We've got a great show. Obviously, we know you guys are fans of it, but we continue to spread the word and continue to grow, and sponsors continue to grow with us. So again, producer at HazardGround.com. That's the best way to get in touch with us, and we will get those products on the Hazard Ground podcast. Now on to this week's episode. Our guest this week is a 17-year veteran of the United States Army, where he was a Special Forces Green Beret, specifically signed as an 18 Charlie, an engineer demolition guy. He was also part of Delta Force, one of the most elite fighting units in all of the world, and particularly in the United States Army. He had three deployments overseas. He is Scott Spooner joining us here on the Hazard Ground Podcast. Scott, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me, brother. Appreciate it. All right, Scott, just an amazing career, lots to get to, and so much that you've accomplished, particularly Delta Force. Obviously, that unit speaks for itself. What I did leave out in the intro is that you currently are still suffering from mild PTSD, mild traumatic brain injury, TBI, and a whole bunch of other issues since leaving the military. And we definitely want to get into that because it's something we discuss a lot here on the podcast. But uh, let's go back to the beginning and talk about how you got in the military. And you actually have an older brother who kind of took the same path that you did, correct? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, Tom and I grew up down in uh, South Florida and um, our inspiration for the military, I can't speak for both of us on this, uh, was uh, an, an uh, uncle of ours and he was a Vietnam vet. He had done three tours and uh, we would come up here to, you know, see him in the summertime and, and just really got a lot of exposure to the paratrooper world. And of course, being on Fort Bragg, and uh, so it was, it was definitely always something that we viewed as uh, whether it was a potential path. Definitely something we respected. Um, you know, I enlisted at 17, um, straight out of high school, and that was in 1992. Um, give you a quick one over the world on um, the military aspects uh, of my career. Uh, enlisted in 92, uh, was in the infantry, went to 82nd Airborne. Um, I spent about two and a half years there, right out for Special Forces, um, got selected, went to 18 Charlie course uh, in 96, got my Green Beret in 97, and uh, when I was 22, and then spent four years primarily on a pre fall team and third Special Forces group, um, then left there. Went to training group and was the head uh, explosives instructor for the 18 Charlie course for Calc and Place. Uh, that was for three years. And then I left there uh, and I went out to Delta and I spent the next six years out there. Um, I was what's known as uh, a heavy breacher. I was in a direct support capacity um, where my whole life revolved around anything and everything on how to get into shit. Um, <laughs> um, my last Last three years there, I was the troop star major um, for that capability for the unit. Um, and then that took me to 2010 or December 2009. Um, I had 17 years in, and um, that's when I ETS uh, out of the military. And so that's, uh, you know, basic one over the world on the units I was in and kind of, you know, jobs uh, that I did throughout that 17 years. All right, a lot to get to there. So let's kind of back it up a little bit. You know, you know talk, growing up, you got into the Green Berets and wanted to do that. Um, going through high school and everything, did, did, did 
anything change? Did your friends tell you you were crazy? Did your parents say no? I mean, you got to remember, you know, when you were kind of growing up, we were at relative peacetime, right? I mean, you know, you had an uncle who was in Vietnam, and I'm sure he told you all the horrors of the whole thing. Never, never had any sort of thoughts of a different direction as you got older? Well, I guess that was the clean, uh, real quick version I gave you. Kind of where you're going back to takes me back to why did I join um, as well. You know, I, uh, I struggled with alcoholism at a super young age, um, probably full-blown alcoholic to the point of blacking out um, by the time I was 14, 15. Wow. And um, I wasn't a bad kid. I had a good heart. I just got in a good bit of trouble. Um, pretty lost. Um, and I, I, as I say, I would have been voted most likely to be dead in a ditch or uh, in my high school yearbook. Um, because they're really, you know, I, I just, I, I've gone to school four years straight. That means every summer, uh, cause I had summer school cause I failed so much. And, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that it was go to the army or go to jail, but I'd already been arrested twice and, um, for bullshit, uh, you know, everything for, oh, not everything, but in vandalism, stealing beer, just being a bad kid. Um, so the, the army really, for me, um, I knew I needed it. Uh, I knew if I went to college, which my mom begged me to do, uh, she didn't want me to join the military. Um, my brother was already there. Um, yet I knew I needed some structure. I knew I needed the discipline and, and essentially the way I was living my life wasn't working. So it was also a pretty safe bet for me to, to hopefully not end up dead in the ditch or in jail or, or really back in the way I lived back then hurting someone else really bad as well. Um, so for all those reasons, you know, inspired by my brother, inspired by my uncle, um, I had a, a, a less than, than good childhood, so to speak, or time in, in school. And, um, really it was a good option for me. All right. So when you uh, enlist, uh, do you get a special forces contract or you have to kind of fight your way through it? Because I mean, I know they're a lot easier to get now than they were back then. Yeah, there wasn't what's now known as the SF baby program right. which off the street into a contract that didn't exist then uh, that they, they were in that. And I think the late seventies, uh, mid to late seventies and hadn't at the time that they actually brought that program back while I was teaching as a special orders instructor. Um, no, I had to uh, join the infantry or join anywhere back then. And uh, you had to be, I think, an E4 with two years in the military before you could even submit to be uh, to go to selection. Now, was your brother already a, a, a tabbed guy by the time you had submitted your packet? He, um, no, we actually okay. got a room very six months apart. Okay, we all right. One Q course uh, difference in, in graduating. Yeah, well, well, sometimes, you know, the Army is smart enough to look at names and, you know, hey, well, these guys are related. He's already a tab. He, he might make a good one, too. Let's send him. Um, you know, then again, there's a lot of times that the Army is not, not that smart, but uh, I was just curious as far as how that goes. So when you went through assessment and selection, given all the troubles you had in the past, did you ever think that you weren't going to be able to make it? Well, the interesting thing about the troubles I had, let's also take into consideration the time I joined. Uh, 92, uh, definitely a less politically correct uh, military than it is today. Sure. <laughs> um, and what I mean by that, right, I mean, essentially, uh, when I got to the 82nd, I figured out real quick that in the infantry to shine, as long as I could do, I was good at PT, I was good at spit shine and boots and pressure uniforms. Um, I was where I was supposed to be when I was supposed to be. Um, I could do whatever else I wanted. So like the drinking, partying, fighting, raising hell lifestyle um, actually played pretty well into being a paratrooper and it didn't do too bad being a Green Beret. So yeah. it, like, like I said, it was like my my weaknesses that were seen on the outside world, interestingly enough, whether it's my mental toughness, my physical aptitude or just my gift at being a soldier. Um, it's like, hey, I was good at this shit. Well, hey, listen, I mean, and, and to put it in perspective for those non-military, nothing proved that you were a badass more than going out, tying one on on a Wednesday yeah. night for no apparent reason, getting into a bar yeah. fight, showing up at formation at 06, ready to go, running five miles without breaking a sweat, and everybody knows it, right? Like, that was the you, definition of a badass back then. You just described it right there. And I, and I, you know, it wasn't so much as I figured out and I did it, I was doing it and went, wow, figured out that this is this is what the best do here. 
Yeah, like um, people patch on the back for that back then. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, and and um, yeah, I mean, you just laid it out, bro. I used to say that. I was like, hey, man, I could drink till four, sleep till six, run till eight, work till seven, and do it again. You know, nothing like finishing a run and having like liquor soak out of your veins, you know, on your skin, you could lick it off and, and get hammered again. I mean, it, it, listen, oh, for that or lighting a cigarette after the run for God's sake. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I grew up with platoon sergeants. I had one that literally would literally lit cigarettes during runs sometimes. That it's is just, insanity. And listen, I've been there. I mean, I've been on a couple yeah. of runs hung over. It was miserable. I can't do it now. In my early 20s, it wasn't a problem. But uh, so I no, certainly can relate. These guys were my heroes. Yeah. It's like, holy shit. You know, and, and, and that did progress. I mean, yeah, I had to grow up uh, from my, uh, yeah, fucking, uh, what's the right word here? More maturity aspect, you know, go, going into SF. But let's face it, especially back then, you know, it was definitely a different time. Um, and it, it just wasn't that big a deal. Right, sure. Now now you show up to formation hungover and you get written up immediately. It's just a, it's a different world. So I'm not saying that it should be the way it is now, the way it was then. But, right. You know, no, they're just different. I mean, different times, different requirements. Everything has changed. I think, you know, everything progresses forward. It's, it's, remember there used to be a time in the military, you used to be able to have beers during lunch. Like it was allowed. You could, there was a two, two or three beer limit during lunch. So, I mean, it's again, just times change. So, all right. When you, when you get to assessment selection, you get through it. Um, you go to the Q course. Uh, when you think back about the Q course, what was the toughest part of it for you? Um, Hardest part for me was um, the actually the academics um, because I didn't uh, uh, I didn't apply myself in school so therefore I didn't do well and I didn't learn um, how to study or, or the biggest part for me on the engineering side was math it came everything from bridge design bridge con, uh, construction uh, classification and all the, the the math with explosives so I essentially had to learn basic algebra and school stuff in the Q course wow. Um, I mean, and the 18 Charlie thing was just because your uncle, not, not, there was nothing else that interested you or you just, you determined you were going to do that. No, I, I wanted to be an 18 Charlie. Um, and just for folks that don't know, we didn't get to, you know, we, we didn't get to pick our job, like all things in the military made a wish list. Um, and 18 Charlie was my number one pick and I got it. And really the reason for that was I had a desire to learn about explosives more right. so than anything else. And for those who aren't military, I don't know, that's one of the things that an 18 Charlie does in the Special Forces world, breaching. You know, whether there's a door there or uh, some sort of barrier, they find a way to blow through it and keep on moving and do it quickly and effectively. And, and um, it, it's a pretty cool job if you like blowing stuff up. And who doesn't like blowing stuff up? I mean, it's it's fun from uh, just any standpoint. So, yeah, I mean, the old, the old line for 18 Charlie was that we can build you a school or we can blow it up. Yeah, either one. <laughs> so it's like all basic construction, wiring, everything through demolitions, and then into breaching as well. So yeah, it was, I, got, I was fortunate that they gave me my first pick. Uh, I was fortunate in that I always said I, I never wanted to go to SWIC to be an instructor, but if I did, I would want to teach the explosive portion, and lo and behold, that's what I did. So, yeah. um, and it really parlayed into the rest of my career, which ended up, you know, having not running being part of and then being in charge of literally the most elite breaching force on the face of this planet uh and so the energetic side the explosive side the breaching side but really what i ended up geeking out on and just falling in love with was like hey how do i harness energy uh to do work in the most you know precise way possible and and that kind of carried me through you know the rest of my career right and SWIC, by the way, for those who aren't military, Special Warfare Center, Special Warfare Center at school. So um, that's the SWIC, SWIC acronym. Okay. Where are you on 9-11? When do you finish the Q course time-wise, and where are you on 9-11? Uh, I finished the Q course in 97. Okay. And um, signed in and went over to 3rd Special Forces Group on Fort Bragg. And I can tell you on 9-11, when it happened, I was sitting at the 7th Group Chow Hall with my team uh, watching it on the TV. Okay. To this point, prior to 9-11, had you done any sort of mobilization? Like, there are SF guys all over the world. Had you seen anything, um, you know, not even combat-related, but just operationally-related prior to 9-11 in the Special Forces world? 
Um, well, back then, like you said, peacetime <clears throat> was uh, primarily uh, J sets, and what that is is essentially how you know the U.S. takes care of our foreign relations, um, and we go and help train their militaries to help bolster their infrastructure. Um, and so, doing J sets uh, into the Middle East, into Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, training with other military forces, um, that type of travel, yes, nothing from a combat uh, perspective, all peacetime operations in other countries. Okay. Um, and at what point in time does Delta come in? This is after your, after 9-11 or before? Well, after. This was okay, a, that's I, what I, I thought. After SWIC, so okay. after my instructor time. So. All right. Well, I, I don't, don't go too far down the road yet. I want to get there kind of chronologically, if you will. So you're in yeah. the chow hall on 9-11. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you guys know the nature of what's happening. How quickly sure. do you think at that point in time you're getting on a plane to go somewhere? Interestingly enough, I already had orders for, for my training for training group. Um, so that was September 11th. And mm -hmm. my report date to go be an instructor for a three-year tour was September 20th. Wow. So I had a different experience emotionally than everyone else sitting around that table. Yeah. Um, okay. But let me ask you real quick. How did you, did you want that slot? Did you ask for that slot? And being the fact that you had only, you know, been a uh, tab for four years at this point, how do they decide who becomes an instructor and who doesn't? Yeah. So, but, you know, during peacetime as a general rule and at F between probably four to six years, anywhere from four to six years, you're, you were going to rotate off a team. Okay. And do something. Um, now, a uh, real quick story on why that happened. It actually parlays into the best leader I've ever had in my life. Uh, it was my team sergeant, a guy by the name of Jim Spratt, who was an SF baby. And part of the reason was I had four years on the team, and he knew that I'd be coming up for a SWIC tour anyway. And the other part was he was a great leader, and um, he saw my alcoholism. He saw my drinking. He saw that. Um, I just had a started a young family, um, and I'll never forget. He sat me down and he said, um, you're going to go get your shit together. You got a lot more potential. Um, and I don't want you to turn into me. And what he meant by that, he said, Scott, I've been doing this, you know, at the time, 25 years. And he says, I got a daughter that won't talk to me. I got a wife that can't stand me and a bunch of dusty fucking plaques. Um, and he literally, as a strong leader was like, you, you need to fucking take a break and you need to go get your shit together. And um, so that was a big reason as well. And I trusted him. To the point where you had realized that you were an alcoholic and a functioning one at that for all these years. Yeah. Not your brother, not anybody else could have snapped no, yeah. you out of that. Um, no. Well, I mean, as far as my stories relates to my alcoholism, you know, I started childhood. Um, dad was an al active alcoholic. Um, brother with an active alcoholic. Your brother, Tom, who was also in, in the Green Berets with you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and a sniper in Delta Force. Yeah. Um, so real quick, let's move to the good news before I get the story. You know, my dad got sober uh, shortly after we, my, you know, my family left. Uh, so he's been sober almost 30 years. Uh, Tom's been, my brother's been sober almost 27 years. And this summer will be 17 years from me. Well, congratulations. God bless you. That's freaking amazing, man. So thanks. So what did it? Your ass is like, no, nah, it wasn't my brother. Even though Tom was sober, dad was sober. I got sober the first time when I was 19. I knew it was a problem back then. Uh, and I stayed sober 19 to 21 and then started drinking again. And then I think from probably 19 to what was it? 25 or 26, I raged. Um, as far as the drinking goes, and to your point, uh, you, you said successful uh, or you, you functioning. Said functioning alcoholic, 100%. Um, the worst kind as far as keeping it going for a long time, because, uh, to your, you know, I would say I got sober uh, September the 8th of 2002. Uh, and at that point in my life from the outside world, what you would have seen was um, a young guy with a great family, young daughter, uh, E7 Green Beret, a special forces instructor, new house, new truck fucking got the world by the tail um and yet inside i was destroyed um and lost and miserable and no self-esteem essentially and um a lot of regret remorse shame for um my behaviors that would happen when i was drunk and um 
it just and, and knowing I had gotten sober once and knowing that I, I was on a path that was going to go, I knew where it went, which is jails, death or institutions. And, um, I woke up that morning, uh, covered in blood, September the 8th, 2002, sleeping on the floor of, of my daughter's room. And I woke up literally looking into the face of a two year old child and, um, uh, looked down, realized I had come out of a blackout and, and done some bad things the day prior. Um, and that was my breaking point. That was my bottom. That was, I'm why, why were you bloody? Uh, I had, um, was, um, actually was cleaning some birds. It was on a dove hunt and, and I just ended up slashing and cutting my hand, uh, pretty bad. Uh, and I actually remember doing it and I remember not caring and it was in and out of blackouts during that time. But, uh, good news is, is that little girl, nor my son, who's now that little girl, who's now at UNC Chapel Hill, <laughs> uh, studying psychology or my son who's now 14, uh, never saw me drunk. And that's something, um, I'm, I'm super grateful for. When, when you wake up in that moment and you realize that this is your rock bottom, um, yeah. How do you know? Because I, I assume you had low points before. Why oh, yeah. was this one different? Um, a few things. One, um, I realized that the behavior I had had the day prior could have caused massive physical injury to other people. My, you know, to include myself, but more so other people. Um, seeing that I'd turned into the person I swore I'd never be like facing the true fucking horror of, I can't not do what I do anymore. Like total lack of control, even though I want to, and like, uh, what am I crazy? Um, and also knowing that there was another way I'd been sober for two years. I'd watched my brother who lived a, a good life. My father who lived a good life, like I knew there was options and I knew that um, I could have that if I was willing to do the work. Um, and if you put all that in my head at one moment, it's just like, OK, done. I know the way out and the pain is finally great enough. Period. What did your wife say to you uh, after that day or that morning? Um, did she find you or no? She no, I actually got up. I remember I got up and walked down the hall to our bedroom to look and make sure she was there because I didn't know where she was or anything. And she was um, and and rightfully so looked up with utter disgust. Um, and I turned around and walked back down the hall and laid down with my daughter and cried. Um, and it wasn't like things got rosy. Trust me, if for anyone that's lived with an alcoholic um, in destructive form. Um, it doesn't just get better. Right. Uh, and it didn't, uh, it took a lot of time and fast forward that marriage actually ended up ending well into sobriety. Um, so the, really what that lends itself to was finally getting sober for me. It didn't matter if I kept the marriage. It didn't matter if I kept the job, it did, nothing else mattered other than I can't live this way because I'm a father. I've got responsibilities. And if I fuck up everything in life, the one thing i would committed not to is like passing on this absolute beast to these kids. Did anybody else in your chain of command p prior to this, you know, this mentor who told you that you're going to get yourself you know, straightened up? Did anybody else try? No, no. And, and, and why do you back, think that is? It was cultural. Um, in my younger years, um, fighting, raising hell, getting in trouble, it was always swept under the rug because I performed. Um, and then later in life, um, performance saved me a lot as well. And I really didn't fuck up a lot at work. Right. Um, uh, it was more so at home, you know, in my, <laughs> my relationship, you know, I, I hurt the love, those that love me the most. And I hurt those that I love the most, um, uh, and the other part is, is a lot of people, whether they're alcoholics or not, let's face it, drinking is and was very commonplace. So you, it's tough for people to judge me because they don't want to look at themselves as well. And I'm not saying that everyone was raging like I was or anything, just the, the general term of why didn't anyone talk about it? What's well, the same reason why no one talks about PTSD and TBI? They don't want to talk about themselves either. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, there may, there may, some of that. I, okay, that makes a ton of sense when you put it that way. Okay, so let's fast forward back to you know you go to get help, and um, at the same time you're teaching at uh, you're teaching at the 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 qualification course um, mm-hmm. and, and kind of putting everything back together. Yeah. Take me just through day-to-day life. I mean, how difficult are things while well, you're trying to stay sober and get sober? At the same time, you're trying to prepare, you know, other men for what is the most daunting physical, emotional, mental thing that they're ever going to be challenged with in their life, and that's combat. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd say I was fortunate in that I did choose or, or I got sober at training group. Um, uh, it's interesting for folks listening. I think the easiest way to describe SWIX like Green Greenberry College, um, because it's nothing but learning going on at every level. Um, and to your point, there's a massive. I I, I felt that massive responsibility to prepare these guys uh, for something that I hadn't even done, which was unique as well. Right. Um, and as far as being in combat, but as, get, as far as getting sober, I mean, it, it's it. As the old Sam went, the only thing that it told me is like, Scott, the only thing you got to do is, is just one thing. It's like, cool, what's that? It's like, change your whole fucking life. Oh, <laughs> just, that's the one thing. That's the one thing, all of it. And so luckily I was in a stable work environment, not on a team. Um, so that was good for me. I was able to, you know, stay active in my own recovery. And at a time that meant going to a lot of meetings and staying involved. Um, and really I would say my students benefited tremendous, tremendously. They, they just got a better version of me. Was it hard for me? Yeah. But they also just got a better version. Um, early sobriety is super tough. It's, it's not rainbows. And it, it's almost like, uh, if you would think about, uh, when a, a tornado comes through, everybody's down in the bunker, scared to death. But when they come back up, um, the tornado has gone. So the major threat of death and fear is gone yet the damage is done. Um, and so that's what getting sober was like, or is like for anyone, for me, it's like, I, you know, I had to start cleaning up the, the wreckage of my past. I had to start owning and, and being responsible for, for things that um, I had, had done, that I had done, behaviors I had had. Um, and so that's a lot of personal life stuff going on during that time. So Work was really a great outlet. Um, you know, the process of getting sober is, is about that wreckage. The tornado's done, the hurricane's through, but um, cleaning up the mess. And, and so I spent a lot of time focusing on that. Did the fact that you had a chain of command that was supportive help through this whole thing? I mean, did they keep you there longer than what you needed to be so you could kind of get through some hurdles on sobriety? No, no, I, I definitely, I mean, I, I didn't want a day over my three year stint. Keep in mind, like, you know, I, I went to go teach the minute the war started. Yeah. Um, it's not an ego thing. It's a warrior thing. Um, it's like, okay, that's where, that's where I'm supposed to be. Um, I flipped that and turned it into, because I can't be there, my responsibility is to train the best war fighters in the world. And so that's, you know, and best 18 Charlies in the world. And so I, I channeled that there. Um, but, but the support of the chain of command piece really only was that one time, you know, Jim, gotcha. anyone else you know, may or may not have known that I was sober, getting sober. Um, so it was all just an inside job. I mean, my close like fellow instructors and friends, I made sure knew what I was, um, you know, about, so to speak in my life and what I did and didn't do just so they didn't feel awkward trying to buy me a beer if we were at the Greenberg, you know, GB club. Um, but other than that, it was just a personal thing. How hard was it for you to be at the school when everybody else that you kind of know that does what you do is in the middle of the fight, but at the same time, knowing that sobriety probably takes precedence over all those things. I mean, it's gotta be a lot of emotions tugging you in different ways, no? Well, yeah. I mean, the one piece that was a known because the training group, commander came out everyone was trying to get out of their training <laughs> everyone wanted to get to the war and because the command knew that they basically blanket statement like you're locked everyone's locked in we don't want to hear it this is done like so in my mind is like okay i've got this time here um now i want to be the the best there is uh and i loved explosives and i understood them in in a super unique way and i knew that i revamped the entire curriculum 
um, I just like, fuck it, I'm going to make this absolute best. And, um, and, that, and that's 100% what I did. And I was fortunate to have a few other super like-minded instructors, just some uh, guys that majority of them ended up at the unit, by the way. Um, and <clears throat> we had a good time with it because we took it serious. Um, and also, quick story on that, I, I had a, two Vietnam vets that were instructors there. You know, Ernie Tabata was a Korean War vet and a Vietnam vet and was a Mac VSOG operator. Um, Pappy was another old Nam vet, five tours. Um, and he heard us talking about a friend of ours that had been killed. And of course, I'm sure we were lamenting about the bullshit of, of not being able to be there and blah, blah, blah. And also sad that our buddy got killed. And we we're talking about one death and this old crusty non bat walks by and hears this. And his only response was, you got to crack a few eggs to make an omelet boys. Um, it's like, wow, there's the reality of someone who's been in war. Um, <laughs> and then his other last statement when we would bitch and complain was his only statement was be careful what you wish for boy. Um, and I heard that old man's voice quite a few times in combat. And I was like, Oh, this is what he meant. Be careful what you wish for. Right. Um, so there was a, it was a push pull of this desire to go get on the battlefield and a responsibility to do our job there, do my job there. Um, so I, I kind of just gave up on the idea that, Hey, I, I'm, I'm not going to get plucked out of here. They don't need me, so to speak. So where they need me is here. And lastly, when I went through the Q course, there were l more instructors there than I thought should be that were substandard to be teaching the world's fucking best. Mm -hmm. um, and on my watch, so to speak, that wasn't going to happen. Gotcha. All right. Uh, let's move forward to 2005 um, as you get to your first deployment. Um, and now be careful what you wish for. Boy starts to come through. Yeah. You know, you, uh, for those who don't know, Scott, you wrote a great, uh, I guess, call it, you know, blog, if you will, um, on a website called, let me just get it here, uh, chairbornecommandos.com. Uh, and I read the whole thing. It was kind of about your time. And, you know, one paragraph begins uh, with something that we talk about a lot here on the podcast. And I'll quote you directly. The world that I lived in and the man that I was prior to 2005 will never be the world that I live in today. I was forever changed in 2005. That was the year I had my first combat deployment. And what we say all the time here is that no matter what happens to you in combat, whether you, you know, unfortunately come back with limbs missing or body parts missing or you come back unscathed, and even if you don't have any sort of mental you know, anguish or, or PTSD or whatever, part of you dies on the battlefield. You never come back the same because what you knew in the world you knew before combat is never the world that you'll see again because you see everything through a different prism because there is nothing like combat ever on this world. And you kind of you know, bring that whole point to light in – uh, in your in your column in your blog here, as you get to that first deployment, uh, what are you thinking and expecting going in? Man, yeah, uh, I expected that I was absolutely ready. Uh, I think at a time I had. Um, well, I'll never do math in public. They say this is 2005. I joined in 92. 13 years. 13 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, fuck, I thought I was pretty damn well prepared. I had all of infantry training. I was a you know, Green Beret. I've, I've been through OTC uh, at the unit. I'd done six months. As a, like, I was more prepared. To, like, shit, I'm like, kids at 18 years old are showing up. I should be good. Um, and... I remember the, the first trip over. I mean, I was uh, absolutely scared shitless and excited beyond belief. Um, I remember sitting on the, the, the tailgate of a 47 with uh, a machine gun mounted to the ramp, flying into the green zone to land at the MSS. Like, holy shit, it, the whole thing was surreal. Yet I hadn't been in combat yet. <laughs> You know, and, and to your point, showing up was one thing, um, and it just had the unfortunate event of my first, you know, really 
uh, that that one deployment, no five, uh, the easiest way I know to put it is like I experienced everything there was to experience in combat uh, for me anyways. My list of blocks to check, you know, I checked them all except one, which was getting shot. Um, everything from, you know, every aspect except getting physically injured, I went through in a, you know, 120 day period. All right. So uh, just, just for just for the sake of the listeners, let's run through the yeah. checklist. All right. Obviously, direct action. Right. Direct combat. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, indirect a- indirect combat uh, IED or mortar. Yes. Yes. Vehicle IED. Anything like that. Oh, oh sorry. As far as I experienced. Yes. In, uh, as far as indirect fire. Um, I wasn't directly IEDs, in and around IEDs, uh, killing people, watching people be killed, um, having friends killed on target, um, two different lost limbs of friends on target, crashed helicopter, um, suicide bomber blows himself up in a house, collapses the house on teams, guys that I helped dig out. Um, let's see what else that trip. Um, yeah, just a lot of rough stuff. I think at that time from 05 to 07, I think it was like 70% of operational people in the unit had a purple heart. It was just absurd. And and Um, for those listening, I I ask you for the resume, not because I'm asking you to, you know, quantify or, you know, uh, I just want to give a scope of experience because obviously, as we mentioned at the beginning, you know, Scott suffers from PTSD, and I just want people to get the full grasp of, you know, the, the depth of, of what happens and, and how it develops. So that was kind of the background of the question. That said, you know, we were there at the same time. Where were you? In 05, yeah. I was um, either in Baghdad, uh, in the Green Zone, or uh, Al Qaim. We stood up out on the western uh, okay. Syrian border, the western, uh, yep. out on the Blue River Valley. And then... Um, Al Assad as well. <clears throat> I was at uh, Robin Hood Palace Complex. Were you there? No. Uh-uh. Okay, I was right in Baghdad. It was on the uh, mm-hmm. southwest corner of the airport. Um, it was yeah. right, right with the SEAL compound over there. It's kind of where the headquarters was for Jay Sodaf, uh, CJ Sodaf at that time. Um, mm-hmm. But anyway. Just wondering if we, had, if we had ever crossed paths. I do remember doing uh, work uh, push packages out to Al Qaim to you guys. So um, yeah. we, we were kind of crossing similar turf at the time. Well, that was also during, if you remember right, that was also during, you know, a massive surge. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. And the surge in the violence had happened, which led to the surge in the, uh, and the actual troop, you know, up to 160,000, some ridiculous number. But- which, which, interesting enough, interestingly enough, for those, you know, out in the the non war world, like that was um, the intent was met. <laughs> yes. You know, I mean, it's like the surge was meant to surge activity. Well, when you surge activity, more more death is going to happen. You know. So it's just like, wow, uh, we actually wanted that in the grand scheme of things. Let's go back to you being thinking you were so prepared for this. So when one of these events happens, you know, when when somebody has to be killed or one of your teammates gets killed. Yeah. What about those moments were you unprepared for? Um man, it, it's it's a generalization, but it's the same damn thing where no, anything new arrives. Now, if you just take something, a new life experience that is the most extreme of that genre, um, to think I would be ready for it was absurd. Um, yet, um, let's just fast forward to the fucking moment of truth. I had seen and done a good bit of things, but the one thing that changed everything for me um was um, the the night that we had uh, had a pander uh, hit an IED, and just because of line of sight, I physically just watched this whole vehicle fucking blow up in front of my eyes. Um, you know, whatever it was, you know, hundred yards in front of me, and they were. Just, I was like, boom, they're gone, and um, we ended up three were killed, two were expectant. Um, my roommate was paralyzed from the waist uh, waist down. Um, I met my roommate while out there in the tent in Al Qaim, and that was the um, that that was the one that the fear piece got me. Um, that's why? The, why? Um, 
Well, I guess to give it perspective, prior to that, um, we had had a helicopter crash and a, and a guy lost his leg. I wasn't on it, but as far as this exposure, it was going on. I remember running into a house for the first time with three dead guys laying there um, who just got shot from outside and running past them. Uh, uh, all sorts of bad stuff had happened. So one would have thought, or I would think that maybe I would have had this fear mechanism triggered at some point before. Um, yeah, it wasn't. And um, what happened was just pure my mortality. It's like um, one of the, you know, one of the guys that got killed that night had waited to deploy with us. He, he came over late because he, he just had a child and, you know, I'm, in that moment, I'm like, okay, he's gone. He's a new dad. The other guy, and so I just played through because these were guys who I knew their some of their family life. Another guy was uh, he was a uh, an immigrant to the U.S. who was a non-U.S. citizen who had become a citizen who was triple tabbed, who had lived this American dream. Like, and and I had had breakfast with him or lunch with him that day, and he had talked about the book he was going to write about his American dream story. And like I watched every fucking bit of that be gone in an instant. Um, and so for me, I had the ultimate fear, which was like I felt like a coward um, because I didn't want to die in that moment. I, I didn't want my kids to grow up without me. I didn't want at the time my wife, you know, all the ultimate fears in life I felt at full gravity, uh, which took me to another breaking point. And uh, the good thing was it broke me on the other side meaning that I literally um, had a specific moment of like clarity around why I was there, what purpose was in life, what my purpose was in life, and that I had no control over the outcome, only on the fucking what I did. Um, and I dealt with it, put it to bed, and, and literally to this day, that's gone. Like, I don't fear death. I have a spiritual understanding around it. I understand what I did as a soldier, and I'm grateful for that, you know, that moment. But that was it. Like I was fucked for about literally five minutes of utter disgrace for how I felt. I felt like a coward. I felt like pure word, um, but I wasn't. And I knew that. And um, once I dealt with the mental aspect of it, it's like, trust me, it was a shit show. Rest of the deployment and the one thereafter as well. Um, but that was just my my little moment. When you have that moment and you have to get back into the fight, how difficult was it for you? No, it, it wasn't at all. It, it was it was literally it wasn't rage. It, it wasn't. It was just a choice. It was an understanding. Uh, and, and then here was the understanding was I knew I didn't need to pack my shit up and go home and and quit because no one deserves to have anyone to their left and right that is not 100 percent fucking committed. Right. Um, and I know that. And um, and because I know that and that's what I expect from those on my left and right, I either have to figure out how to do that or not. And um, it, it's, let's go back to the point we made of like how ready was I? On one hand, I told you I, I should have been the most ready person in the world. And so that is true. And I had to remember that, like all these different things, like I had to take all macho, all ego, everything and face the reality of I was nothing but a human that was on, on a battlefield that was fucking at this moment scared to die. I had to acknowledge it, that that was true. I had to acknowledge that that didn't make me a coward. It made me human. And that actually I possess the courage that most don't. And because of that, that's why I'm here. So walk fucking forward. Very powerful stuff. Um, you know, I, I, I can remember one of the, one of, well, maybe it was the, maybe the, the second firefighter was in the first one. I didn't have to, I didn't have to, uh, to pull the trigger, but I remember the first time that I had to do it. And you know, you're staring down the, the side of your rifle and it, it seemed like forever in my head, but I know it was only a split second of, of real time. But when, you know, you acquire the target in your sights and there was part of me that thought for a split second, you know, I pull this trigger, I'll never be the same again. Like you recognize that moment as it happens and then quickly it's, well, them or me. And, you know, and in the matter of a, of a, of a split second, you know, you make the decision and you go forward and you kind of forget about it. But those things kind of stay with you and they come back to you. Um, and and it, it is repetitive. And sometimes it's hard 
for it to get away from it that you did the right thing or you were wrong in the moment for hesitating or you were wrong in the moment for feeling what you're feeling. Um, when, when you say that you were able to admit it and, and reconcile it, how did you do that? Man, it's just, to me, it's almost an explicable. It's such an, inti- it's such an inside job. I mean, that's a spiritual, emotional, like deep thing. Um, so I, I don't know how other than I, it was a culmination of everything I said. It's like, I have the training. I was there. I know I'm a warrior. I've, I've been on this path my whole life. I still am. So I just did it. And, and, and I'd, I'd like to use your story to, to bring up another point. I don't sure. know how you feel about this, but it's interesting when I talk to folks, especially around the PTSD aspect of it, because the common assumption from, from the, the private sector is that we have our, that I would, I'll keep this all about me. I don't want to put anything on you. No, no, go ahead. We can have a conversation about it. I would have psychological disorders or issues from the killing, from the war, this, that. It's like, for me, it's like, no, that shit is just part of the game. Um, Anybody that showed up there with a gun trying to kill me did the same thing I did. I showed up there with a gun trying to kill them. Um, What happens to me or them, um, we both signed up for. It's everything else around combat that is the spiritual debilitating aspects of back to my life was never the same after 2005. Your life was never the same. And for me, I'll say it's because I experienced the absolute utter fucking underside, underbelly of humanity. Um, And the rest of the world hasn't that hasn't been to combat. So for me to this date, uh, because to your point, I can recall with great, great clarity the first time I went from that selector switch, unconscious act of fire, to fucking thinking I only shot four times, to actually counting rounds that night out of curiosity. I was like, I shot 12 fucking times. Jesus Christ, you can shoot fast when when I'm scared. Um, (laughs) You you move really fucking fast, you know? I never did that. I never bothered to count the rounds. I I never even thought to do it. I I just did it the the, the one time, the first time, uh, and it's because I knew I didn't shoot anymore that night. But it makes me wonder why. And you're like, you bring it up, it just kind of hit me. I I, I never did that. I never, I don't don't know how many I shot. I couldn't even tell you. I just wanted to see if curiosity is like, how many times did I think I shot? And I thought it was like three or four and it was 12. I was like, God, I'm working that. Um, um, (laughs) You know? That's a uh, a weird thing. I don't know why. I'm just, it's just literally, it just struck me. I don't know why it's like, it's like pouring out of me right now. I'm really trying to think back to how many times I pulled. I can't even remember. I wish yeah. I, could, I wish I would have counted now. Well, and it's yeah, it's just the, the fog of war, so yeah. to speak. Respect. But but also, you know, I, I, I want to make it to me. It's like, hey, I, I don't bring that up. It's like, oh, I'm cool. I should have No, no, not at all. Yeah, no, you know, it's it's you know, it, it's um, it's like everything changes. Um, and the one thing that. I still would have gone. I feel certain you still would have gone. Uh, yet no one, you know, ever put it to me in a way like, "Hey, when you come back, nothing's going to be the same." Um, right. right. And it's because it's a, it's a new set of glasses that I have on that I and those glasses. That's my perception. The way I see the world will never be the same. Um, normal is new. It, normal is relative, and it's new normal. Um, it, it, it's a it's a fantasy. It's a fairy tale. People say, Hey, when, when is he going to get back to the way he used to be? When, when am I, for me to say that it's the biggest pipe dream. Um, it's like, okay, um, get back to the way you used to be, um, before you ever had sex. How about that? Right. Fuck you. That's impossible. Your life totally changes, you know, in every way. Or or even a better example to people who have lost their parents. Right, you, you didn't know a life, you didn't know a world existed without your parents on this earth. And when they're gone, you have a new set of normal. There is no more mom and dad, they're not here. It's just a different you know, set of circumstances. Yeah, so, well, there's that and, and, and where I would say, and I just brought up the sex, not even as funny, is like there's things in life that we all experience that once we do, it forever changes yes, the shape and sure. perspective moving forward, right? Mm-hmm. And that's definitely one thing, and this is as an extreme of thing, you know, um, and with it comes um, emotional loss, and that's the way I understand it now. Uh, it's it's literally psychological, emotional, and soul loss, which a lot of these other things don't come with. 
Scott, mm-hmm. through, all, through all this that you're dealing with while you're overseas and, and realizing that you were afraid and everything else, ever take a drink? Any desire to have a drink? <laughs> no, no. And, really? No, yeah. Because um, I drank a lot overseas. <laughs> yeah, well, there was plenty of alcohol to be had overseas. Um, you know, um, rules or guidelines. <laughs> right. Um, and, I, you know, I can, I can say specifically that um, the cool part uh, one cool part of, of my story is that, yeah, I mean, I was sober throughout all of that and stayed sober, was there when bottles were, tops were put off bottles, when flags were being fucking raised and, and lowered, like things where camaraderie is everything and taking a drink out of that bottle means you're part of that tribe. Um, I faced that numerous times um, and with judgment from others at times as well. Um and the answer is no, no, no drink. Well, good for you. That's awesome. All right. Um, you have been officially diagnosed with PTSD, but that wasn't an easy path for you. Take me through um, kind of, yeah. one, your decision to get out, because that one in and of itself is an interesting story. And then two, kind of how you end up with this diagnosis and do you know you have it or, or what leads you to the point where you have to say, I need to go get help? Yeah, I'd say... Um, Take into consideration the environment at that time uh, in 2009, the environment meaning that um, the way of life was either deploy or prep to deploy. Right. Um, And no one was talking about PTSD, TBI. No one was talking about emotional, none of this. Um, Yet, I'm sure everyone, yet I'll speak for myself, I was dealing with tons of signs and symptoms, tons of symptoms. I was having panic attacks. I didn't know what they were. I would have crying spells, whether I was driving home from work by myself or sitting there watching a movie and get emotional triggers. Uh, I would get lost on the way home, literally lose. Like I don't, I know that if I drive long enough, I'll find a known point and then I can get back home. Um, and all of this was going on. I was angry a lot. Um, and I can tell you that when I drove through those gates into the, the unit um, for the first time, I thought I was the happiest human on the face of this planet because I was going to get to work at the best place in the world. And in 2009, every time I drove up to that place, I fucking hated it. And I was pissed off coming through the gates. Um, and, and, and I was mad at leadership. I was mad at, at, at everything. And, um, I held it together long enough to fulfill my duty, which was, I promised him three years as, as a Sergeant major. And that's what I gave him. Um, and when I reached to the, to the end of it, all I knew is that, um, I had to go. I coupled that with the true statement that I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. And let's, you know, I've always thought that special forces unit, any special operations organization in the military is for the entrepreneurs of the military because there's less rules. There's, you know, more creativity and that's the entrepreneur in me. So if you couple my desire to, to go be an entrepreneur with the fact that I was essentially losing my mind, um, it was, that's why I left. I was, I wasn't diagnosed. I just ETS. Um, and after I got out, um, it was actually a guy from the care coalition, uh, Mark Boyette, who is, does, has done amazing things, uh, for the special operations world down in Tampa, uh, as an advocate, uh, because he knew my brother got to know me and he asked me, he's like, so what's your diagnosis when you left? And I'm like, what diagnosis? He's like, you didn't get any tests. I'm like, no. He's like, nothing. No. He's like, okay. Hit pause. He's like, you're gonna go get tested for PTSD, and um, I, I did literally like the comprehensive civilian doctor, you name it, uh, twenty hours worth of testing, and it's like, hey, you have, and I was diagnosed with chronic and severe PTSD, in um, probably like I think January, February of 2010. A few months after I got out um, and um, was pissed off about it. Uh, I didn't want to face it. I didn't want to admit it. Um, and I sat on it for probably about a year um, when I got out. Although they didn't diagnose me with chronic and severe PTSD, they, the military did diagnose me with 
um, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, uh, chronic prostatitis. Um, I was on uh, antidepressants. I was on sleeping pills. I was on muscle relaxers and anti-inflammatories. I was taking 12 to 15 pills a day. Good old VA prescriptions, huh? Oh, yeah. And, and it's, it's the solution mm-hmm. for everything. And I had no emotions. Uh, you could have walked up and fucking killed a puppy in front of me. And I would have been like, that's interesting. Um, because I was just flat, you know, absolutely flat deadline from, from all the meds I was on. Um, and, you know, I walked that path for a good while uh, until the trigger happened uh, to start doing something about it and start seeking help and treatment for PTSD. And then what definitely turned into figuring out that there's mild traumatic brain injury as well. And that's further on down the story. What's the trigger family, friends, loved ones. Um, veteran suicide. Um, veteran suicide was definitely a big part of, um, the trigger, uh, at the time, um, a friend of mine in third group, uh, had killed himself. Um, and he was, you know, 14 year career, three kids, great. I'd known him forever third group. And, um, coincidentally at that time, uh, the, uh, special operations command specifically reached out to my brother and I to take part of a suicide awareness video for all of us SOCOM and they wanted active duty green berets on there and they knew they couldn't get anybody from the unit on there that was still on active duty and we were both out. So they asked us, they asked us to come uh, and do it. And so we agreed to just because we were really twisted about the suicide rate. And so Tom and I went and did that. And then the other big catalyst was we were approached by the NRA. I had a friend who was a board member and they had started a new series called um, Life of Duty. And it was designed to tell stories of first uh, first responders, military, law enforcement, firefighters, tell stories that people need to hear but aren't told. And so when they approached, when they approached Tom and I about that, it was more so, hey, it, there's a cool story here. Two brothers, both paratroopers, both Green Berets, both in Delta Force. And um, that's the story they wanted. We, Tom and I, agreed that the story we would give them was, you're not going to say anything about the unit. We're not going to talk about war stories. There's going to be no bravado. You're not going to glamorize anything. And we're doing it to raise awareness around veteran suicide, PTSD, and TBI. And they agreed to it. And that really was a massive catalyst for myself as an individual and as uh, a philanthropic effort financially, emotionally moving forward in life and still is. And it turned that turned into an 18 minute documentary uh, on Tom and I. Um, and that's also when we put ourselves out to the world as being, you know, th- there was no other ex Green Berets or unit members getting on YouTube, uh, making a documentary, uh, crying online and saying, Hey, we're fucked up. We need help. And, um, so it, it was, you know, it was a huge deal, uh, for us and, and, and also afforded us the, the opportunity moving forward. It's like, yeah, being open and honest about all of it, because I don't really give a shit what anyone from the unit work, my old life thinks of me. Um, because I'm not going to give up anything I shouldn't talk about. And I am going to talk about anything I need to talk about that potentially is going to help wake someone up to the point of having them realize that what it is they have as a life after combat doesn't have to be alcohol, drugs, depression, going back overseas, fucking divorce, everything that comes with it. It's like I've went through all that shit and the purpose for it is for me to be able to tell that story in a way that gives others hope, period. Powerful stuff, man. Um, so where are you today with everything? Um, man, I'm in the best place I've ever been in my life. Um, I've parlayed an amazing 17 year military career and to now 10 years in the private sector as a successful entrepreneur who's created a, 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 a life that's nothing but passion that's aligned around 
you know, creating the facilitation of more powerful humans at a global level. I now work in, um, you know, in the private sector fully. So I'm, 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 I'm able to really, I am realizing the other half of the American dream now. I've lived a life of service, of a warrior, of a protector, and now I live a life of an entrepreneur, of someone um, who is experience, experiencing everything that freedom has to offer um, and understanding that from 17 to 34, I wasn't truly free. And a lot of people in the private sector don't get that. What was tougher for you to overcome, the alcoholism or dealing with the PTSD? Um, oh, PTSD. <laughs> really? Yeah, alcohol, uh, uh, um, they're actually very similar. Um, and it's, it really relates to any great change in life. It comes from a pain point, And then once we have pain, we have to surrender. And once we surrender, we have work to do to make the pain, uh, the change permanent. And with alcohol, um, until an alcoholic's willing to stop, willing to admit it and willing to do the work, they're never going to change. And with PTSD or a psychological disorder or TBI, any of it, it's like until I was ready to admit, yes, I have it. Two, am I willing to do something about it? Three, now go do it and let the change occur. And because to me, alcoholism was almost more one faceted and less complex than the issue of PTSD. And because when you look at PTSD and TBI, their symptoms overlap. And so most of us have both. Uh, um, and we're trying to navigate the human brain and the psychology of it and then dealing with the physiological effects of the emotional effects of it. Um, we're, we're talking about things that just fuck us up at the soul level, the physical level, the mental level. And so it's a much more complex problem to solve. Are we making quantifiable strides in dealing with PTSD? 100%. How? Um, How do we know? Uh, I I just I can only speak for me personally. Okay. And the snapshot, if we go from the snapshot in time from when Tom and I got out and we made that documentary to this date, um, the amount of people talking about it, massive. The amount of awareness, massive. The amount of people from the past that never would have talked about it that call me now that ask me how people I've never met that call me. So if it's happening for me, it's happening everywhere. Um, I mean, the president, um, you know, president Trump just, just um, doesn't matter if I support done support right now, he's the president and he just made um, whether it's a bill or not to put people uh, assemble a board to deal with mental disorders of combat. Like, now, on one hand, that's a great thing. He'll probably fuck it up by not putting the right people on it. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, it, it, that is an indicator. There's indicators everywhere that the awareness piece is drastically increasing. There's indicators through, through stuff I read that they're looking at different treatment modalities and understanding. So, yes, strides are being made. The suicide rate wasn't 22 and if you believe stats, it's dropped, I think, to, to, to 20 and a half or one, right? So that's a massive reduction um, at scale on a daily basis, right? So, yeah, we're making strides 100% at every level. When you kind of look back at the years, do you, do you feel like you wasted years? Do you feel like you missed out on anything? I don't want to use the word regret because you're a product of your experiences. I'm not, I mean, maybe you do regret some things, but... You know, uh, is there anything you do differently? No. Uh, and to your, your statement, I absolutely uh, have a belief that regret serves zero purpose. Uh, it's, it's not in my vocabulary. Um, I know I have, I have gratitude um, for every aspect of it uh, to the best of my ability. And that's a truthful statement. I mean, there's some days I'm still pissed off um, about certain things that happen. Um Yet I know that that's just a human emotion. And then it's like, cool, what did I learn from it? And how did it help shape me? Or what do I need to share about it? So no, zero. I, I'd do it all again. 
We've mentioned your brother a few times here, and you know, full disclosure, he was supposed to join us. We were going to do a tandem deal, but yeah. how much of him in your life dealing with a lot of the same things has been instrumental in helping you overcome some of the challenges in front of you? I mean, Tom's role in my life has been instrumental in many ways and still is. Um, specifically, um, it, it, he was an inspiration um, in sobriety, um, a, definitely a massive inspiration in sobriety of what was possible. He showed me what living sober, not just not drinking, right, uh, but living a sober, purpose-driven um, faith-based life, um, just being a better human. So he showed me that, what that looked like. Um, uh, in the military, Tom is absolutely one of the most um, effective warriors I've ever met um, in every aspect. I mean, his career is second to few uh, for everything he accomplished. So he was an inspiration there. Um, the PTSD side, we definitely inspire one another. Um, and, and, be, and what I mean by that, right, none of us, no two of us have the same experience and none of us can get in the head of the other and understand emotionally what the other person went through. So it's really um, with he and I, we're great sounding boards for one another. We don't claim to know how each other feels, yet we accept one another wholly. Um, so the beauty of our relationship, a lot of people don't have is being two veterans, two warriors that right. also have brotherhood. So big help on both sides. What haunts you more, alcoholism or PTSD? Hmm. Like if you're going to wake up in a cold sweat yeah. one night, is it because of alcoholism or is it because of PTSD? Uh, PTSD. If, if you're going to have a moment of weakness, is it something PTSD related or alcoholism related? PTSD. I'm just, PTSD. and I'm not asking, forgive me, I'm not asking you to compare the two of them. I'm just yeah, trying no, to, I'm no. trying to, I'm trying to get a grasp of an understanding of, because these are things like generally, even though you may be quote cured, you you still live with it every day. No, you you can't escape it, right? I mean, it, you you don't say, "Hey, I'm a, I'm a cured alcoholic." You know, I mean, you, you you are a recovering alcoholic. You're still recovering, right? So to to that well, end, you well, you still deal with this stuff, right? Well, that actually depends on who you talk to. Okay, I, I, I choose to make the statement that that I am a recovered alcoholic. Okay, um, that means what I've recovered from is a is a hopeless a, a hopeless state of mind and body. I have a choice to drink or to not to drink now. Before that, I didn't have a choice. I had to drink because, I mean, that's a whole alcoholism aspect. But no, to me, and the reason I can I, I can say that is because you can put a drink of alcohol in front of me and I go, I don't want. Uh, so I, I don't deal with that anymore. So, and, and the wreckage of that, I, I cleaned up that past long ago. I said, I'm sorry for that stuff where it's, inverse in a lot of ways that the stuff that happened that caused the mild traumatic brain injury, the blast, the, 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 the PTSD, that gets caused in an instant or over a short period of time and lasts a long fucking time. Gotcha. Okay. Is there anything physically from combat that you're still suffering with? No, I'm okay. an enigma. I'm an enigma on the physical side. I'm probably the only guy you know that have talk to that's never had a surgery or a broken bone and had the career I have. It doesn't make seriously. Sense. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, that's, do you and your brother ever compare notes, share war stories, do any of that? Um, there's stuff like that, that we talk about is intriguing because Tom's had a broken back, neck surgery, knee surgery back, you know what I mean? And other guys. So that part's just kind of funny because he knows my career and it wasn't like I dodged any tough stuff. Um, so and, and no, there's never a comparison. Do we, you know, combat stories, funny stories. The cool thing about Tom and I is, yeah, we, we shared so much, but we were never side by side. So like, I never had any of these experiences together. So when he tells stories, it's, it's no different than when you hear it, I'm hearing it for the first time too. So it's kind of cool, you know? So yeah, I mean, we spend a lot of time uh, telling stories and whatnot, but. When you look back on your military career, would you 
say it's the best thing you've ever done, worst thing you've ever done? How do you characterize it? Um, my military career absolutely provided me with ex- the experience, uh, ultimately rich and extreme experience of both high and low um, that less than a handful of people on the face of this planet, right, will get to experience. Um, And because of that, it has facilitated my help facilitate the success I have in the private in, in the rest of my life. But primarily in the private sector, I, every uh, all of my tools, um, that's the birthplace of them. All of my mindsets, that's the birthplace of them. So really, it's like I look at that with absolute just total the, the, those 17 years now. Um, man, that's the foundation of everything I draw on that enables me to be great in doing what I do now. Well, Scott, look, I mean, I don't even know how to encapsulate uh, 17 plus years and in, in where you are today and, and sort of put an effective ribbon on it, so to speak. But, you know, I mean, the message that you're sending out now more than anything, maybe some of your most important work uh, and, and all the challenges you've had to overcome. Uh, I think if it gets you to this point, then, you know, from the standpoint of thanking you, uh, I'm glad you are where you are now. But certainly uh, I am personally happy for you to have overcome all the demons that you've dealt with and be able to stand here today and be a better person for it and make others better around you for it. Yeah, man, I, I appreciate it very much. Um, and I'll, I don't know if that's what you're giving me, but I'll take this opportunity to put a bow on it, so to speak. Um, I was sitting here thinking about everything we talked about um, in that if there's a, you know, a clear message that I would like folks to, to take away from here, um, it's, it's that one, um, try to relate, don't compare. And that's at the military. So if you're a veteran, uh, relate to anything I said, don't compare yourself. We all have our own individual stories and we're all more uh, similar than we are different. If you've never served relate, don't compare because everything, um, that we did in the military is done out here in the private sector. And by the way, struggle is struggle and pain is pain and trauma is trauma. So there's a lot of themes around what it takes to wake up to the fact that something needs to change in life and then what the grit that it takes to move forward and that, you know, all things are possible, really. Um, If you've got a guy like me who barely graduated high school, who came up in a broken home with alcoholism, who was an alcoholic, who's been to combat, who's done all these things that I, you know, I could be limited or put in boxes. I don't have a degree. I don't have all this. Um, Is actually sitting here sober, a published author, the owner of a company that's worth millions of dollars, the podcast, the um, dealing and consulting with um, multi-billion dollar executives to still continue and to help veterans in and around PTSD, start suicide awareness campaigns. Like everything I'm saying is is something that I helped start. And I'm, I'm saying I to point out that I being this guy that, and statistical stance should not be any of these things. Do you know? Don't let the world and its stereotypes limit you or where you're at, where you're going, and don't let the fact that you went to combat potentially and you are now forever changed get in the way of you actually living and experiencing what true freedom is as a private civilian, go fucking live life and, 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 and in the future and in the now, and don't hang on to the bullshit touchdown stories of the past. What are you doing now? How are you living now? And, and, and what are you doing to take all the bad of the past that is there and turn it into something good now? Choose to do that, man. And I appreciate you giving me this opportunity to share my story and that little message of hope there at the end. Beautifully said, brother. Scott Smurner, thank you for being part of the Hazard Ground. Thanks, brother. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno and produced by Matt Pascarella. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.